Almighty God, we, we thank you, God, for giving us this day, for giving us this time, for giving us this opportunity to be here in your presence today. For all that you've done here. We love you. May your will be done. May your, may your presence fill this place, oh God, in everything that happens, in the kids' ministry, in the um, different ministries that we have here, the radio sound, the greeters, everything that happens, oh God, be glorified to all of it. And as we hear your message today, as we hear our Stories proclaiming your goodness, O God. As we come to you, God, be lifted high here among us. Amen. So this first song is uh, based off of some of the psalms of, of David and another psalm is saying, I know God's with me. And, and the like happiness and excitement of that. But it starts with this line that's taken from the psalms, young but not older. And I think for me, made me sing this song because I'm older than he is. But... It uh, doesn't mean I can't rock it out. So if you would, uh, you can stand and clap with us. This is one of those songs that I think clapping is good for. <laughs> Jesus, I heard him call my name. He said, Follow me. 
So she left on 29th of June and she came back last Saturday. So I had her room from 1st of July till technically 3rd of September, right? So I went without a room, I searched for a house, everybody, literally, you guys were praying for me. That I know you were praying for me. So on 1st of July, I moved into her room until 1st of September and I was looking for a house. I'm like, I have no idea where I'm gonna find a house. I subscribed to every housing agency. I asked everybody I knew. I did everything and I was like, how am I gonna find a house in Amsterdam? My budget was even 1,000 euros. Like, and I had no house in Amsterdam, it was like crazy. And then in a few weeks back, I was just on Instagram casually scrolling and one of the people I knew from Kenya, when I studied there, was looking for a roommate in Amsterdam North. So I found a house. And my house contract was starting from 1st of September. So God provided the exact amount of time at my friend's house that I needed before moving to my house. Like, guys, just take a moment <laughs> to really just understand God's faithfulness and God's goodness. And even the greatest part of that, I lived in her house rent-free, so I had enough time to save for my deposit. And, you know, God knows what we need, and he's just a faithful God, and he will provide. And that's the end of my God's story. I just wanted to say thank you so much for me. So, I am going to be doing the announcements as well, and I have some announcements, and we're going to do offering as well after. So, on Tuesday at 8, there is a Bible study at the Landers family. So, if you guys don't know who the Landers are, our pastor is, is, is Landers, and his wife and his kids. And it's at Ellie, yeah, you can go find him and get the address, and you want to be in his Bible study. And Damascus Road University Ministry is starting on Wednesday. Are you excited? If you've never been part of drum and you're new, you want to go to drum. This week they will be hot dogs. Yes, like, exactly, yes. That's the kind of energy we're looking for. So they will be hot dogs. It will be a, a new um, season. So, you know, get ready. Get ready. So you should go. If you don't know where it is and you want to know where it is, Find Denali, find there, find the address. <laughs> Add them on Instagram if you want to keep up with the events. If you don't know, if you're not on the Facebook group, you want to be on the Facebook group because everything is literally mentioned on the Facebook group, and I think sometimes on Instagram. And then this Saturday we will have a prayer meeting from 8:15 to 9 at Jemima's house. Guys, you know. I just learned this, not, not this season, but I just learned the most important, the importance of prayer. Prayer is like important, it's like necessary. So I encourage you guys to be part of the prayer meeting at Jemima's house. The address is with a minute single 93 <laughs> next to the station. So if you don't know, ask Jemima, ask, ask anybody, ask Judith, ask Praveen, they'll all tell you. And after the meeting today, now don't leave immediately after the meeting. You know, if you're in a hurry, just try to stay around. There's gonna be some bread and things to put on the bread after <laughs> church. So you might wanna stay and grab a snack and chat with the people around. We wanna get to know you if you're new here. And yeah, we want, you know, you guys, this church is just a family. Like I was reflecting this week and I was like, man, I'm never gonna find another community like the Muscat in my life. And I just love you guys. And I wish I could carry you with me, but it's okay. So, um, Another, 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 another announcement is next Sunday, there is a Serve the City picnic at the Refugee Center. So if you want to be part of a picnic from Serve the City, there will be one at the Refugee Center. If you don't know where it is, ask Pastor Matt. He will let you know. And this Sunday after, not, not today, the Sunday after, is it the Sunday after, like, after, after. So the Sunday after, after, not next Sunday, but the other Sunday. So I'm guessing it will be like 26th or something. <laughs> oh, okay, then yes. 18th of September, mark your calendars. Open your phone now, mark your calendars. They will be at potluck. And now, let me challenge you. you I, I love that I can see different people from different countries. 
go at the next one meal, it's gonna be like mega. It's not like just your regular potluck, you know? It's gonna be like a mega potluck. Bring a dish from your country, let everybody try it, and let's see who is really like, you know, bringing their food to the, yeah. Okay, uh, we're now gonna do the offering, and I will pray for the offering. And you can give to the NL90, the Ivan there. And you can scan a QR code to give a 20 euro fee. No, it's not a fee, offer fee. But what this is used for, it's used for the Netherlands, for the university ministry, it's used for other ministries like the tea, the coffee. Also, if you want to serve in any of the ministries, feel free to reach out to one of the servant leaders, uh, William, Judith, Pastor Matt. And we also use it for renting the church and the salaries. And I will pray for our, the offering. Dear God, thank you. Dear God, thank you so much for, yeah, for how good you are to us. And thank you, God, for how you provide for us and the different ways in which you provide. And I just want to pray for the offering, God, that, yeah, that you will, you will continue to bless us um, as we give you our first and give you what we have. Um, yeah, I pray that, yeah, that you will use this or guide the leaders to use this offering in, in ways that glorify you and um, yeah honor you. We thank you and we yeah we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Also, if you have not signed up for the weekly <coughs> church email, you might want to sign up through the link bitly bit.ly. It should come somewhere here, maybe. Stroke the Moscow Shore at IC, DRIC News, and you can get a weekly update. You can get a weekly update of what's happening in the church, and you also get a short note from the pastor that we. All right, uh, I've spoken a bit too much. I will now read the Bible reading, and it is from Acts 22, verse 2 to 16. And it says, When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsic of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priests and all the consuls can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Sal, Sal, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus, because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. And he, had, he was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see, to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now... What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Hi, my name is Matthew, also known as Bell Wonders now, apparently. <laughs> uh, I'm also called the pastor here at Damascus Road. Uh, there are faces I know quite well. There are some faces that are newer to our church. Um, so just to answer, what can you expect from Damascus Road? You're like, well, I show up this church, what's it gonna be like? Uh, here's, here's what we wanna be. Our church motto is this. We, the church, as followers of Jesus, will love as Jesus loved, will teach what Jesus taught, and obey as Jesus obeyed. Uh, and I'm not 
not saying we're there perfectly yet, but that's our goal. That's what we want to see happen. Uh, and I personally, I, I want to be like Jesus. Because he's like incredible. I mean, yes, there's, there's all of the important theological. He's the son of God. He's the lamb of God. He's the bright morning star. He's all these, he's all these things. And those are really important and good. But, I mean, if I just think about who Jesus was as a person, I want to be like him. He was incredible with people. It did not matter whether you were rich or poor. He was able to interact with you. The young, like, kids loved to run up to him. Old people he could talk to. Uh, it didn't matter if you were powerful. He didn't, like, change just because, oh, this man has power. Like, Jesus was himself through and through, no matter who he was around. He was able to talk about all sorts of things. Like, often we just go, Jesus, he spoke about religious stuff. But, like, he, he talked about business and, and lawyers and doctors and, and raising children and sexuality and being in a marriage and, and fishing. Like, Jesus was the kind of guy who could talk to you about anything and find a way to make it, like, deep and profound, but also just really simplistic. And I love that about Jesus. I'm like, I want to be like that. Jesus was someone who wasn't just a robot. If you read through, he had like real emotions that he felt. He got angry, and I can relate to that. He got frustrated and annoyed. I can relate to that. He got sad and troubled and distressed. I, he didn't just pretend like these things didn't happen, and yet he could be joyful and calm and peaceful and sleep in a boat. Like, Jesus was impressive to me in so many ways. He was someone that could actually work hard. He wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to let fame and power get to my head that I'm in charge of things. Like, he could, he could command a crowd that would listen to him, and yet he didn't let that get to his head, which is not true of a whole lot of people who are good at having a crowd listen to them. And he felt just as good talking to one person as 5,000 plus people, because he cared about each individual, not just, oh, well, what are my numbers at today? And he had the like integrity to back it up. And that's a big deal. Like, there are so many people who can, like, they can impress you in so many ways, but Jesus had that and also lived it out. He practiced what he preached. He called people to do the things he did, to forgive like he did, to love like he did, to serve like he did. Because he could say, look at my example and follow that. That is part of what makes Jesus so amazing to me. And the fact that he did all that and like just stayed in good contact with his heavenly father. And that's maybe the one thing if I can be like, what could I take from Jesus? I wish I was as good as always paying attention to God the Father. Because Jesus is like, yeah, I only say the stuff that I hear my father saying. I do the things I see my father doing. It, he just kept in relationship and kept that close and didn't get distracted, didn't get the whole, I can do this on my own thing. He was, just, he was always present to the, the Father. And I wish I was more like that. So that's the first step. I don't, I don't know all of you especially well. I don't know what you study or what you do in your daily life, but don't just think Jesus is for your like religious time. Jesus is for every part of our life. No matter what kind of thing, if you're cloning hamburgers, or if you're chopping up chicken, or if you're <laughs> growing things, or if you're just studying law, like all these different things that we do, know that Jesus is a genius, but not in the kind that can't like interact with people, but was so emotionally intelligent. I just, I'm amazed by Jesus, if you can't tell. So there's that. Um, But the, the, the name of the church uh, is called Damascus Road International Church. Why? Um, if I love Jesus so much, Jesus is in the story, but why does it seem like it's a story based on this other guy 
named Paul, or, or Saul. Like, Saul was his Hebrew name, and Paul was his uh, Greek kind of name, and so sometimes he was known by those two. We have people in our church who are like, oh, I'm normally known by this if I'm in one country and by this in another country because of naming the thing. And that's sort of his situation. Sometimes we look at Jesus and go, Jesus started out perfect. So yeah, he did it all right, but like, it was easier for him. So that's part of what I like about Paul, is like, he's a guy who made a whole bunch of mistakes that we didn't realize it. Uh, and then only later went, oh, that was wrong, and started to do that, like, okay, I want to be like Jesus thing. And got to a point where he could say, follow my example as I follow Christ. And I go, okay, so if he thinks that he has this example that he lives in, and Paul said, I'm not perfect yet, but I'm on that way, and if, if you want to be running towards Jesus, follow me, that's where we're going. Uh, that's kind of what I want to be, and what I hope we are as a church, that we say, hey, follow us because we're headed towards Jesus. So Paul's story. Uh, we, we heard some of it from his own lips, so to speak, in Acts 22, where he's saying, yeah, so I started out really religious, uh, really well-educated, uh, he was probably well-traveled, probably well-to-do, like, Paul had a lot of the stuff that you would have wanted to have at that time. Minus, <laughs> I had a conversation with someone yesterday, he probably didn't have good, like, dental care or, like, medical hygiene available to him, but he had all these other great things. Um, and he thought he knew what God wanted, and he thought he knew what he wanted. And Jesus was not in that picture, uh, or at least not in a good way. And he had some of the same thoughts towards Jesus that a lot of people have today, often, where he thought, number one, uh, Jesus is wrong. So he didn't believe that Jesus was truly this, this Messiah, this promised one, this anointed one. So he had the whole, like, Jesus is not really a thing uh, and, and shouldn't be a thing. So, and, and it, I don't need Jesus in my life. It was sort of like, yeah, Jesus lived, but I don't, I don't need Jesus to be a part of my life. That's the first assumption that he lived off of. I don't need Jesus. Second assumption was this. Jesus is actually bad for society. Uh, and following Jesus is bad for society. He truly believed that and was willing to find people and make them change their minds in any way that he could, including throwing them in jail, throwing their families in jail, even getting some of them killed or beaten, all these sorts of things. Because he said, look, this following Jesus thing, it's rotting society. It's bad for us. I don't know if you've known anybody who said, I don't need Jesus in my life. I bet you do. You, there might be less of us that know people who are like, and I need to see if I can stop this whole Jesus nonsense. But Paul was one of those like, I don't need Jesus, and nobody should have Jesus. Let's get rid of it if we can. And, and that's what he tried. Until he's on his way to the city of Damascus. He's on the road there, so Damascus Road, that's where we connect our name from. And he has this encounter with Jesus, that switches his whole mentality about this whole I don't need Jesus thing, uh, and his mentality about Jesus is bad for society. And so after having this encounter with Jesus that like opens his mind, opens his eyes, opens his heart to uh, truth in a new kind of way, it starts to transform his character, it starts to transform the things that he does, it starts to transform his understanding of God and the world and himself. And it leads him off in this destination that goes toward uh, trying to share about Jesus with as many people as possible because everybody needs Jesus. And Jesus is good, not just, honestly, only for religion. Like, Jesus is good for society. If people follow Jesus truly, it changes the world we live in in good ways. It's not just for heaven, it's for here and now. And so we've taken that whole like change that happens in Paul's life and made that what we call our roadmap. That we want people to have an encounter with Jesus, but not just one but, like continuing, uh, to have illumination that, that opened up, uh, brightened our minds, that we would 
be illuminated by God's truth, that we'd be transformed in our character, and then go towards the destination of what God has for each one of us. And those things, it's not just like a one-time thing. You want to have an encounter with God, that, like we continue meeting with him. Like I said, I'm, I think Jesus is fantastic because Jesus stayed in contact with his heavenly father like consistently. So we want to have that kind of encounter. We want to not just like, I've learned all this new truth, now I know it all. But like continue having our minds changed and renewed to learn more and more of God's truth. Continually being transformed in inside and outside. And not just saying, oh, I reached my goal, I'm done. I reached this destination and I can stop. But instead of continuing to follow wherever Jesus will lead us. So that's our, our roadmap, and we're going to talk about the individual things over the next four weeks. Spoiler alert. Uh, and this week, we're talking about the encounter. I'm going to speak about encounter, and some of the others will uh, also share in this series, if you want to call it. It is a series. Oh, it's a series. So we'll talk about encounter, but know that these things aren't like a formula, that they always go in that order, and they, they interact with each other. In the encounter, we'll be transformed as, as our minds are changed. It sends us on a destination. The, these all overlap, but sometimes we try to break things out so it's easy to see, okay, here are, here are steps on that road. So an encounter. Um, the... Encounter of Saul is the one that I kind of want to start with. Uh, what kind of encounter might we have with God today? Or maybe not what kind of like when might that show up? There are a lot of people who, who want, they like, if there's a God, I'd love for God to interact with me somehow. Uh, so here's some of the ways if I look at Saul's life. Uh, if we just start at the beginning. So uh, when you're about to do something stupid, is sometimes when God shows up. And in that case, Paul was trying to go get more people thrown in jail and hurt and killed and be against Jesus. And so he's about to do something. That's a bad idea. And Jesus is like, why are you doing this? Why are you persecuting me? That's sometimes, for me, the hardest times to want to listen to Jesus. I don't know if you've ever had that whole, like, uh, I have set my mind that I'm going to do this thing that I kind of know is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then you have that, that part of your conscience that seems to be the Holy Spirit or Jesus speaking to you saying, why are you doing this? And you might be like, I'm not listening. <laughs> Stop and let that encounter happen. Instead of ignoring. So anyway, what do you, what do you want, Jesus? So there's sometimes that. Uh, sometimes the encounters that we have are, are after we've already hurt people. Like in, in Paul's case, he had already ruined families, and then Jesus shows up, and I don't know if you have all like. Man, could this have happened months ago before I had guilt about this? Because I didn't have guilt then, but now I have guilt because I realized what I've done. And sometimes we have that like, oh, I know I've done something wrong, and I bet God doesn't want to talk to me. Jesus in this story shows that's not true. Like, he knows exactly all of the junk Paul has done. And shows up and is firm with him. It says, why are you persecuting me? But at the same time, it's an offer of, I'm here to actually talk with you. It's not, I'm not, I'm just going to leave you alone. Sometimes, those moments after, when we can look back and go, I wish I would have done things differently. We can know that actually, like, Jesus wants to have an encounter with us in those moments still. To offer the forgiveness that comes from him. Other times in, in Paul's life, where when he had these encounters with Jesus, for one, I mean, sometimes it happens when nobody knows or sees or cares. 
Paul talks about how, like, oh, but I, I received the, this good news directly from Jesus. It wasn't talking to me about other people, but, like, there was apparently this moment where, like, Jesus, I don't know, sits down with them and, and talks through, this is what this good news means. Um, it seems like while he was living in sort of, like, this wilderness area, and it's when I was like, man, why don't we have more about that in the Bible? It's just, like, one sentence where he talks about, like, oh, then Jesus showed up to me and talked to me about stuff, but doesn't explain the rest of it. I'm like, I want to know more, and I don't. I don't know if people have ever thought that about my life. Man, I want to know more about your times with Jesus. But what I can tell you is there are a lot of times that I've had with Jesus when no one else was around, no one else was interested, no one else was encouraging it. But it was just the... Okay, others might not see this, but this is important. Who are you when, when no one else is paying attention? When, like, only you and God are watching? There are some times where we're like, okay, no one's watching. I can let my guard down and, like, do whatever I want to. Instead of saying, uh, I am who I am no matter whether people are looking at me or not. I'm going to continue... To make myself available to God, even when it's not my parents telling me we have to have a prayer time now, or even when it's not, I'm at a church thing, so I should probably look good. Sometimes those <laughs> the most life-changing encounters happen when no one knows or sees or may ever know. So that doesn't mean that they're not important moments that we have. I mean, sometimes those encounters do happen when we're praying. Uh, it, it can happen in a religious setting. Paul talks about a time he was in the temple and he was praying, and then he has this vision, and Jesus tells him stuff. He's like, okay, well, it's not bad to spend time around church and religious settings intentionally trying to connect with God. Sometimes it'll happen way outside of that, but there are times where Paul had these meetings where there was that, but other times it was on the road. It was in a house. Probably more often than not, these encounters with God were not just in what we would call a church meeting. Probably talk more about that in a bit. Um, as much as there are those moments when, like, you have an encounter with Jesus because you're all alone, sometimes it's an encounter with Jesus because of other people being around and, like, talking to you. And there are moments where it's not like, I see Jesus' face in front of me, and I see, like, Trey's face in front of me. And he's talking and saying something that, like, is coming from what Jesus wants to be saying. But Paul had that in, in the story that we heard. We're like, Jesus has, like, shown up to Paul, blinded him, said, hey, go into the city, and you're going to be told what to do. And then instead of Jesus showing up again and being like, hey, you remember the voice? <laughs> yeah, you do. So this is what I was saying. Instead, Jesus goes and talks to a guy named Ananias and says, Hey, Ananias, this is what you're supposed to tell Paul. Ananias is smart enough not to say, Why don't you just tell him yourself? Like, you can show up to me. Why can't you just show up to him? But Ananias sort of acts like that. Where he's like, Last I heard about Paul, he wanted to kill people like me. Are you sure about this? And Jesus says, Yes, go. And Ananias obeys. Sometimes it's hard to be that one who obeys to go talk to someone who you think hates you. Those might be really incredible encounters. But Paul has this other person who comes to him and says, so this is what Jesus said. And I have definitely had times in my life where sometimes people are like intentionally saying it and they're like, oh, I, I felt like uh, God wanted to say this to you. Or I had this like picture in my mind that I believe is for you. But there are other times where like, people say something and they're not trying to be spiritual or religious. It's not thus said the Lord, but it just hits in a way that you go, oh, I need to hear that. Sometimes those encounters with Jesus happen because of other people speaking into your life. Don't shut that out. Sometimes those encounters with Jesus aren't because other people are trying to speak into your life, but because you're actually going out and investing in other people. Which is, I think, sometimes the one that people avoid the most. 
Because we go like, oh, yeah, well, um, I don't know if I should go talk to people or if I should go serve these people. I'm going to wait until Jesus says something and then go. But Paul, like, when he talks to churches, one of the times he wrote to him, he says, like, I am hard at work until Christ is formed in you. Paul wanted to see Jesus in the people he was ministering to, in the people he cared about. He's like, I, I will find Jesus there, because Christ will be formed in you as this goes on. And Jesus gave us similar ideas in Matthew 25 when he is speaking to two groups of people, and some of them have gone out and fed the hungry and clothed those who are naked and visited those in prison. He said, when you did that, you did that for me. I'm like, wow, we didn't even notice. But sometimes you see Jesus and the people that you're intentionally serving. Instead of like, Jesus has to tell me to go feed that person. It's Jesus saying, I'm hungry. So go, go feed Jesus. So we have those in ten more ways to encounter him. Um, there are obviously more options, but my hope is that in, in the week to come, that you all will have moments, at least one where you encounter Jesus in the same type of way that, that Saul did, where, where it, it humbled his pride, it calmed his anger, it changed his mind, changed his life direction. And my hope is that you all get to have encounters with Jesus like that. And that may seem like a big deal. It may seem like just a tiny thing that makes that change. But when you know that Jesus is meant for you, it starts to make the change. The question is if you stick with it, I guess. Um, but he wants us He wants us to have those, and sometimes they come without you trying to find it. But there's still this encouragement for us to truly seek Jesus and find him. So let's leave Paul for a second and we'll go back like centuries, centuries before that, there's this prophet named Jeremiah. And he was writing to uh, the Jewish people who had been taken out of their country and so they've been moved to a different nation and another place they honestly don't want to be. And there, God speaks to this prophet and says, tell, tell these people a message from me. And part of that message as he goes through, Jeremiah 29 is where you can find this line. He says, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek with all of your heart. I will be found by you. And this idea that man, we seek with our whole heart. Honestly, I think our generation is just really bad at wholehearted things. We think we do something wholehearted because we did it for a week. Man, I tried real hard, put in all this time. Oh, got it now. <laughs> Going on a journey, we're like, man, if that took me like 28 hours in transit from door to door, oh, I'm such a long time. And it is, I've, I've done some of those airplane rides, it's not fun. <coughs> but then I think back, what, three generations, and you have people that would take eight days just so that they could take a boat across a large body of water that you can't see the other side of. I live in the Netherlands. We complain if the train is slightly late, and there's no train that takes you longer than, what, five hours to get all the way across the country? And then I go to India, and I'm on a train for 22 hours to cross, like, a quarter of the country. And, like, we have to, like, oh, I put in so much effort. I took the train the whole way. Hey, you sat on your butt for five hours. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sorry, this is maybe off topic. But then we'll have this one like, man, I read my Bible like every day, probably at least two or three verses, and, and God didn't show up. I didn't have this encounter. And 
wholehearted in my name. I know a kid, he's my son, and he gets a new book and he can read through it in like two days. Because he's excited to be reading. And I'm like, man, it took me so long. I, I had to read one chapter at a time so I could get through Proverbs. So I got it done in a month, which isn't a bad thing. I can, I can encourage those. But just don't tell me that that's like, man, I tried the hardest I could and nothing happened. Man, go find Jesus. Search for him. Seek. When we have a prayer meeting, 8.15 in the morning, oh no. Really? If you really want to find Jesus, 8.15 in the morning isn't that bad. Try 4 o'clock in the morning. I know people who do that. Every day, you have so that they can pray from like 4 to 5 before they go about their day. Because they are seeking God. When we have our all-night prayer, it's going to be from like 9 until midnight. And some people are like, man, I prayed a long time in two minutes. This isn't to be like condemning or harsh, but it, it is at least to say, man, when we say seek God with your whole heart, if you want to find him, then, then put some effort into it. And know that sometimes it doesn't come quick. Not everything is a microwave society like we have. And all those things that we can go out and find now, it's like, man, this is so easy. All I have to do is go out and buy it. But like, the farmers that had to grow things, they understand that things take time to grow. People are like, oh, that beautiful jewelry. The people who had to mine down for that, they know what it takes to get a diamond. And we just think, I just had to work enough hours so that I could get this little diamond. Seek him and find him. So that was said by Jeremiah. And then let's fast forward back to Paul. And when he goes to this foreign country and is speaking to them there, he tells them something really similar. He uses some of these same words about like, God has decided where people would live. Uh, he's put them in these different nations so that they might seek him and just perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. Now, Paul is someone who actually did spend time reading, studying, researching, seeking God. He would have known Jeremiah, and I think he was pulling on that idea. If we seek wholeheartedly, we'll find him, and God wants people from all nations. Look at yourselves. You guys are all beautiful from so many nations today. So God puts people in all nations so they can seek him and find him. He wants to meet with us, but that doesn't mean that we never have to put any effort into it. So I guess the question is, are, you want to have an encounter God, with God, and are you willing to keep going do that. And, and once you've had an encounter with God, are you willing to keep going and keep going? Uh, recently, uh, a few weeks back, I got to go to one of the theme parks here in the Netherlands because I've been given like a, a coupon for my work, more or less. Uh, so we went with six people, myself and, and five others. And I'm going to make this analogy of roller coasters and encounters with Jesus. It's not a perfect analogy, but just stay with me. So uh, the first thing we did in the day, like we walk into this theme park and we find uh, a roller coaster that's close by, and it's it's the kiddie roller coaster. It's it's the easiest one, uh, and it, it goes two times around. The first time is like easing you in, but the second time they speed it up a little bit. It gets exciting. Six of us went on that first roller coaster. After we got off, two of them said, that was our first and last roller coaster of the day. <laughs> We're good. There are four of us that are like, ooh, let's go for the next one. So we went to the wooden roller coaster. Uh, if you've ever ridden on wooden roller coasters, they're known for being bumpier and shakier. And I was the one of the four with the most roller coaster experience. And I said, if, if we can avoid it, don't sit in the far back, because that's where it feels the bumpiest. If you've never ridden on a wooden roller coaster, that's just what you know. Uh, and I knew that some of these with me might not be in for like shaky, bumpy ride. Now, as a kid, I was always like, I either want to be in the very front because you get the best view, or in the very back because you get thrown around and it's awesome. I was that kid. So I said, let's try not to be in the back if we can. 
that failed because they put us in like the second and third from the back. So I'm like, well, I'll take a second from the back. And like third from the back, I think you're far enough away, it's okay. The four of us rode on that ride. And after it was done, two people said, yep, we're done for the day. Man, some of the best rides were still to go. And I was gonna go. And there was one that was with me. I said, yeah. Okay, let's go. Like, yeah, can we find another one? Let's do it. So to bring that analogy, um, there are some people who like they meet Jesus, and you're like, that that was enough for me. One was good. Thanks, Jesus. Bye. Some people will be like, okay, first one it's okay. It, yeah, that, that felt kind of good. Let's go for a second. And then when you have an encounter with Jesus that leaves you shaken up. It isn't just smooth sailing all the time. They're like, you know what? Never mind. I'm done. I, I'm having that. The third roller coaster we went on is one of those that uh, it's a metal roller coaster and you're suspended, so like your legs are hanging out. And first, it takes you up really high. It leans you over, so it shows you where you're gonna go down, but stops. <laughs> And then you don't know exactly how long it is. Like I counted watching a different one, like I think it was three seconds, but when I'm sitting in there, it was not three seconds. It was longer. I'm like, when does this go? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> then it plunges you into darkness. You can't see a single thing. <laughs> then it flips you upside down a few times and just throws you around. We finished that one, and I looked at the other person with me. Okay, where's the next one? Let's do it. Encountering Jesus will sometimes shake you up. It will sometimes make you feel like you're hanging and then send you to some of the lowest parts of your life. It will sometimes feel like you're going into darkness and you can't see anything. The, the first song we sang today uh, references a bit Psalm 23. It says, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil because you're with me. Are you willing to go through the dark just because you know Jesus is there? And sometimes encounters with Jesus are going to like flip your world upside down and you'll be like, oh, did not see that one coming. Today I don't know which one you are. And uh, if you're that first kind that just says, have my encounter with Jesus, I'm kind of done with that. I just want to coast the rest of the day. You can choose that. Uh, if you have a second that says, if it gets shaky, and like, uh, I just, I'll go with it as long as it's not shaky. Maybe I'll go back to the first encounter, but I don't want any more of them. That's your choice as well. But honestly, what I'm looking for is someone who will say, I'll go with you to the next encounter with Jesus. I don't care what that looks like. Put me in the dark, I don't care. Turn my world upside down, I'll do it. Because I can trust that Jesus will be with me. Let's do it. So I'm in. Who else is going to go? I think you're asking the right If you're not sure, you can think about it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God who encounters us. And just like you're this big, wild God, though, that like some parts of you are really loving and caring and, and healing and safe and calm, and some of them call us into situations that are uncomfortable. But thank you for being a God who's willing to show us yourself. Give us all of who you are. Even sending your son so that he would give up his life for us. Because you're willing to sacrifice that much. So thank you for being willing to give us all of who you are. And I pray that we would be willing to give you all of who we are. To show you our lives in every moment. Because you can see them anyway. But to not try to hide from you. To not try to give you the cold shoulder. Or the silent treatment. I will come to you no matter what. 
as you lead us, change us to be more like Jesus. I pray that if there's anyone in this room that hasn't, hasn't made that decision to follow Jesus, that they would start talking like you. Even if they don't know exactly the perfect words to use, that they will seek you and find you because you're not far from any of us. I know you're here available to us today. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. One of those ways that we encounter Jesus is, is through this uh, ceremony, through this symbol that we call the Lord's Prayer. And Wilma's going to come up and like lead us in that time of remembering Jesus and what he's done for us. All right. Thanks, Matt. I love that analogy of the roller coasters. I'm someone who loves roller coasters, and just comparing encounters with Jesus to that, it gets me very excited. I'm, I'm up for the journey. I'm, I'm ready to keep going. So thank you very much. That was amazing. Um, so yeah, as Matt said, one of the ways that we can encounter Jesus is by um, having Holy Communion, as some would call it, or maybe you use a different term. Um, the Last Supper. Um, it's encountering Jesus by remembering what he's done for us. Remembering that he was willing to lay down his life for us as a living sacrifice. Um, willing to die for us and take on the punishment that we, that we would deserve for our wrongdoings, for our mistakes, so that we don't have to be punished, but we can receive forgiveness, and we can try again and start in this new journey with him. Now, not longer from our own strength, but through the strength of the Holy Spirit. So, I wanted to read just a little bit from the Book of Luke, chapter 22. Stick with the 22 because we're all doing Acts 22. Where it says in verse, from verse 15, Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And then he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we have some bread and some grape juice prepared in the bag. Um, we, the way we do it is different from time to time. Uh, today we chose to do it this way so you can break off a piece of the bread and, and dip it in the grape juice. Um, as we remember the way that Jesus' body was broken for us and the way that his blood has been dripping for us. You know, I think there's something powerful in, in the act of actually breaking the bread and realizing I'm part of the reason why Jesus had to suffer like this. Or I'm part of the reason why he had to die. Um, and just to remember that, to remember that our actions can lead to something. And we need to consider our actions in that way. And just to remember that it's thanks to Jesus we can receive this forgiveness. It's thanks to him that we can have a new start. It's thanks to him that we can now have this encounter with God and, and be restored and start this journey with him. As we remember Jesus' sacrifice, let us remember the invitation that was there for us to now surrender our lives to him and 
live our lives as a living sacrifice in service of others who are in need. So yeah, as we do this, there will be some music just playing in the background. And let's just take some time to really remember the work of Jesus. Do that in a prayerful way and, and you seek his face. Seek for that encounter with him as you're trying to remember him. Ask him to speak to you. Ask the Holy Spirit to work in your heart. And maybe reveal some of the things that he wants to, to work on in your life at this point. Let us go on that roller coaster ride together and rest for you. Have this communion together. Let me just quickly pray before we go into that. Father God, I thank you for the freedom we have to meet together like this. There are so many people who when they want to meet like this, they have to do it in hiding, they have to do it in secret. There's so many people who will persecute it and hate it for following you. Currently, we're in a place where we can just freely meet like this. And I thank you that we have that privilege. Let us not take that for granted. I pray that as we have communion, that we may have an encounter with you. Would you come with your Holy Spirit and move among us? Would you speak to our hearts? Maybe for some of us, this may be the first time where we really encounter you. For others of us, it might have been a while since we last encountered you because we've been going the wrong way. And maybe some of us, we just encounter you on a daily basis because we are eagerly seeking after you. No matter where we are at, at this moment, I pray that together we may encounter you this morning. And it will leave us changed and it will leave us different. It will not just be for the experience for today, but in the, in the weeks, the months, the years to come, it will leave an impression. And it will change us, it will transform us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So, yeah, while the music plays, we're not going to dismiss by rose. Just as you feel like, okay, I'm ready for this, you can go to the back, grab a piece of the bread, dip it in the juice, and then just have your moment with Jesus. Um, in Damascus Road, we practice open communion, so if you, if you would confess that you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you're free to participate. You don't have to be a member. We don't really have membership at this church anyway. People come and go, you know. Um, so if you just want to have this encounter with Jesus, if you yeah, want to confess your faith in Him, then you're free to participate. If you're in a place where you're like, eh, I'm not too sure about this, uh, we would kindly ask you just to, to respect this um, symbol that we that we have. And, and just you know, don't participate if Jesus doesn't really mean anything to you. Um, but if Jesus is important for you, you're free to partake. So, yeah. Who's excited to encounter Jesus?
sing a new song now, so it's a bit of an active song, but I'm a bit nervous playing it, so if you want to join along, let's sing along and clap along, that'd be very good. It's a fun song, so you'll feel like clapping. But when you feel like clapping, don't hold back, do clap. <laughs> let's get started.
following Jesus of what that looks like, or Wednesday night, join the drum, it's, it's a great chance for the university age students, you don't have to be a university student to join. But all these opportunities to pray with us on Saturday, take those chances to, to be in community and see where God's going to be. Go have some great encounters this week. And hopefully see you next Sunday.